today. CC. What happened? I... Pay up. <laughs> Pay up. Let me just say, I have an idea. First of all, I realized two seconds ago I have nothing to do with my hands. Pay I up. Was Listen. This is a, this is the best side job I ever had. Pay up. Okay. Give me my hundred dollars. Dear Amazon, I'm getting a box of pens. Don't I will matter put them unless they're going to attach the them to your legs. I'm going to put them under. Uh, what the show was this, Nick? Table. 154. This is the last time I will ever start the show without a pen. Hundred bucks. It's two hundred no, bucks in two days. You bet that I would Pay forget. Up. Jenna. No, he. He bet on you again. He, <laughs> that's why he I'm lost. I'm the only one in the world got confidence in you. Oh Give me okay? that money. Now, that's it's costing me money dollars. having confidence in this you. This is never going to happen again. This time, okay. I well, even then. got a warning from Brian, who well, works with us, who then said, Then I'll go broke, remember. because I'm going to bet against you having the pen Monday every day morning, the rest of the year. box of pens mm -hmm. under the desk. I'm good ordering morning, everybody. Well, if you're a friend of the show, shipping. I'm just going to leave this out here. If y'all know Jenna, there's a good chance some of that going to go in the next body if we keep this up. Yeah. All right. We are richer and we are poor here on First Things First, and what a lovely way to start our Friday morning, TGI This Day. Let us begin the show with the reason you can never turn off a Cavs game when they're down 17 points in the fourth quarter and also when LeBron is on the team. Cavaliers and Wizards, and oh so much LeBron. Cleveland trailing by 17, just over seven minutes to play on head coach Ty Lue's first night back from sick leave. LeBron said afterwards he wanted Ty Lue to get the win. So guess what LeBron did? He single-handedly did just that. He scored 13 of his 33 points in the fourth quarter. Cavs win. They've now won 10 of their last 11. After the game, LeBron James talked about his mentality in that fourth quarter. Well, you know it's time on the clock. So, you know, I don't, I don't have a quit uh, bone in me. You know, so if I'm on the floor, I got to try to make plays happen no matter what the score is. And, you know, it's just my mindset. With the way LeBron was so instrumental in that fourth quarter comeback, what's there left to say about what he's done this season? Stop point shaving the first three quarters. <laughs> about to give me a heart attack, man. Like, just if you play like that from the jump, we win by 20 something. It's good to hear Tyloo yeah. back. I'm glad yeah. he's got a good sense of humor. CC, how do you think the Cavs were able to pull off this big comeback? It, it, are, are we getting tired of saying it? I mean, it's LeBron. Now, LeBron, and I like the fact, and I believe it's important. I mean, these just aren't any games. It just isn't any type of comeback because we saw what LeBron was doing, but also his ability to get comfortable with the other players on the court. Cal Corver missed an extended amount of time. Not only a, a death in his family by his brother, but also a foot injury. So that kept him. Now, him and LeBron were in sync. So for me, it was not only LeBron. I like to see the other things because I believe the other things are things that can make the Cavs a championship team. Cal Corver's going to have to be able to hit shots. We know LeBron and Kevin Love, they have trust among each other. But now the emergence of... <laughs> Uh, the guy that you had no confidence with in the Jeff season. Jeff Green. Okay, so you weren't worried about the team. No, but I thought Jeff Green was a useless acquisition. And now when you look You've at... You've been on seven different teams, right? Man, and CeCe, I'm sorry to interrupt you real quick. No. The advanced numbers tell you the Cavs are two different teams. Somehow, with Jeff Green on the court and with Jeff Green off the court, now he's going to be in the starting lineup for the playoffs. This was one I totally missed on. I thought Jeff Green was not going to be helpful at all. He has been somehow a key contributor. Go ahead. They got five shooters on the court. If, if they play him at the four, LeBron at the three, Love at the five, the center position. Now, Kevin Love's a little out of position, but what it does is it really spreads the court for the Cavs. LeBron, it allows him to get to the rim as much as he wants. He gets to the rim now more than at any point in his career. And it's not just because of his overall dribbling skills. It's because of the, the teammates around him and him being comfortable enough if they do collapse in the lane, he'll dish it to a Cal Corver or someone else where they'll knock down a three. But the thing that I think is going to pay dividends is not only him being in the lineup green, but his ability to be able to guard some perimeter offensive players that the Cavs had problems with before. Typically, they had LeBron or JR. Those are the only two players that they could put on perimeter offensive players. Now they have Green to be able to do that. And you can see a lot like they did with LeBron when, um, when uh, Derrick Rose was the MVP. Mm -hmm. Late in the game in the fourth quarter in that series, they put LeBron on him. 
Last night we saw them put green on him, and I've seen this rotation. So they're doing a couple things besides LeBron James. If I could just talk about some other things, which I believe are just as important as LeBron taking over the fourth quarter, and that's the comfort level of all these guys coming back and playing together. They still haven't played a game, Nick, right? Still have not played one game with their full playoff At this roster. point, maybe they shouldn't well, because I, they're doing <laughs> real well just kind of throwing players out there. I, They've won 10 of 11 without a real start. But like five. Nick said, when they get together, they have to be better. The, I right. mean, that's just the normal. Better than they, what? They, well, they, didn't, but they didn't have a point guard last night. Yes. And, uh, yesterday, was a, it was a game in three parts. Three acts, I should say. First act, first quarter and a half, Cavs are up 15. The next two quarters, the Wizards go on a 58-28 run in there. And then the way the Cavs closed it out once LeBron came on in the fourth quarter. Some context for what happened last night. Going into last night 463 times this year, a team had been down at least 16 points with six minutes left in the fourth quarter. Those teams were 2 and 461. Wow. In LeBron's career in that situation, he was 0 and 162. Mm -hmm. So even by LeBron James standards, what happened last night was unprecedented. To not only have a 17-point fourth quarter comeback, but a 17-point half a fourth quarter comeback. It's not like they were down 17 to start the quarter and then started the comeback there. Mm -hmm. No, they, the Wizards had extended the lead to 17 with just under seven minutes left, and then the Cavs made their comeback. But who they were playing matters last night. Because Michael Jordan famously created grudges, would, would find reasons to get up for these midseason games. Mm -hmm. We have to remember who Washington is, what they said last year. Washington has never played this version of the Cavs in the playoffs. Now, last year, Washington said the Cavs were ducking us. The reason the Cavs didn't fight for the one seed is they didn't want to play us right. at the, the end playoffs. of the season. The Cavs had an opportunity. They could have gone for the number one seed, but with injuries and lineup switches and everything, they decided they rested some players. They gave up the number one seed, which and, Washington didn't have to say anything, but they added to right. the rivalry. And by the way, Washington could have guaranteed the Cavs have to play them by just winning their own playoff series, but they don't win their own playoff series they chirp they were scared of us they didn't want to see us how did LeBron play the first time they played Washington this year oh he had 57 points and then yesterday we're not losing this game period point like now they mm -hmm. could have lost the game they needed everything to go their way at the end but once LeBron was inserted in that game and he either scored or assisted on eight of their final nine baskets where he was running point forward controlling the entirety of the court and then at the end of the game guarding John Wall by the way you talked about the Jeff Green being able to guard these guys throughout yes. games seven times this year LeBron has guarded an opposing player in a one-possession game in the final minute. In those seven possessions, the opposing team has scored a combined zero points. So that's a bit of a defensive closer you have mm -hmm. when you need to have it. But this also, this game was important. We found out yesterday Kyrie Irving is done for the year. Therefore, the difference between the three seed and the four seed is you get a hobbled Celtics team if they get there in round two, or you get a Raptors team that is going to have the best year in franchise history in round two. If they had lost this game, we'd wake up this morning and they're the four seed. That was an important win, and we now go down the list. They snatched Toronto's soul twice in the last couple weeks. Washington, give me that. You saw Scott Brooks having, I mean, uh, an emotional meltdown on the sideline as he saw it happening. I mean, th you said, CC, these Cavs players who are new need to see yes. LeBron do this to guys. Yes, and, see and what then happens. be a part of it. Yep. Chris Mannix yesterday brought up a good point, just that when you look at this team offensively, they're playing great, but defensively, they, they have a few questions. They gave up almost 90 points in the last three quarters. Are you worried at all about that, even though you talked about defensive closure? Does that bother you at all, just that they're, they do give up a ton of points? Uh, it doesn't bother me as much is because I've seen them shift gears in the playoffs. I know the style of basketball in the playoffs is different, and it's not as if there's some powerhouse offensive team juggernauts that they're going to be playing against. You have more time to prepare. You have more time in practice you understand the sets of the other team better and Cleveland's the only team that I've seen do it 
Toronto, we've seen what happened to them. Forget the first 65 games of the season. Let's just go to the last two weeks. They have no confidence going against Cleveland. We saw what Washington, the news out of uh, out of Boston with Kyrie. They're, they're one of the best defensive teams, but they can't score in the fourth quarter. So, yeah, we're not a great defensive team, but it's not like we're going against the, the 85 Lakers or something <laughs> out here, like Showtime. So, I think they run in con- together. Okay. But... Also, I've seen the Cavs make that switch and play good defense in the playoffs. Listen, and they're going to have to be far better defensively in the NBA Finals. And throughout the Eastern Conference playoffs, when you insert Kevin Love as your starting center, you are saying, we're going to be at a deficit defensively. Yes. We are going to try to outscore you. We are removing all rim protection. Mm -hmm. We are going to try and outscore you. And that's what they – and by the way, that's why they always have – they've had a top five offense all year long. Now on this run, they've also had a top 20. That ain't that great, but better than 29th defense. They've had the 18th ranked defense in the league. We saw last year, I bring this up a lot, all-star break to end of year last year, Cleveland Cavaliers, mm-hmm. 29th ranked defense in the NBA. Last year in the NBA playoffs, I think the third ranked defense in the playoffs. So they, they do, there is a switch they can flip to a degree. There is a switch, but there should be concern, Jenna, because yes, their defense, that will get them through the East. But when you get to the West, you're talking about Houston and Golden State, who are both in the top 10 offensively and defensively. So, yeah, Cleveland, they might be able to get to the finals right. with the defense they're playing now. But if they were to win a world championship, it's got to be way better. Yeah, they'd have to play a lot better. All right, we'll talk about this more again. But still to come today, Dana White joins us live in studio. Got a lot to talk about with him. We're back Nine with it. more. First things first. All right, this is fun. We watched this as a staff yesterday. Tiger Woods Day 1 Masters is in the books. How did Tiger do? I guess it depends on who you ask. He shot a one over par, seven strokes back of the leader, Jordan Spieth. He only birdied three holes, and it was his first over par score in nearly two months. But Tiger Woods remained positive after his opening round. I felt great to be back out there again. Um, You know, I've only come up here in the last couple of years just to have food. Um, so it's nice to get out here and, and play and, and know that I had this golf course in front of me. Uh, it, it was a, it was a, a day that you know, the ring was kind of puffing up, changing different directions. Um, I didn't, didn't play the par fives very well today. I played an even par. I played um, in a major championship again, but also the fact that I, was, I got myself back in this tournament. And I could have easily let it slip away, and I, get, I fought hard to get back in there, and um, now I'm right back in this championship. First of all, can I just say that Comeback Tiger is far more honest, far more forgiving, far far more open, and far more, hey, I'm a humble guy, and I'm just trying to do it, I'm going to do the best I can, than the old Tiger that we used to see. CC, talk to me. How should Tiger feel about his rounds? A great observation by you. He really has changed. Um, we talked about it earlier in the week. We would have never seen him play a practice round with Phil Mickelson. You know, not unless they were in the Ryder Cup and somebody was forcing. And they were doing it just for the camera. So he is softer. He is more real. Um, He's enjoying being in the tournament. But he realized, though, he could have been out of this tournament after today. And when when he hits that drive on number 11 and it goes a fair way over, at that point, which led to a bogey, which really affected him. And the way it affected him was the par three, number 12. He hits a nine iron into the water. Now, he said that the wind came up. It fooled him. It puffed him. He didn't didn't make solid contact with it. So that ball goes into the water. So he has to take one of the most dangerous drops, penalty strokes, at Augusta. That's where Jordan Spieth began to crumble on number 12 because you're below. It's the lowest point on the course. And where you have to drop the ball, you have to hit the ball up on the green. And the green is a very, very small and narrow green. So he was able to get it on the fringe and make a bogey compared to making a five, six, or seven, what we've seen people make. And then he comes back, he sprays his drive on 13, but somehow he salvaged a par on the par five. In that in that um, stretch, in that stretch, if he doesn't make birdie on 14, he can kiss this tournament by. He's going to play this afternoon. It's just a matter of just going around the court. And that was the, the key, right, in him yes. just keeping it together and salvaging the, it and the, the not key, letting it get away from the him. The key was the putt on 12. 
because at that point, he had, you got to keep in mind where his mental state is. He's one under through three holes, feeling, man, that's yes. just, he birdies a hole at Augusta for the first right. time. I have to a go a little days. beyond that because that, it was a cr- critical putt that he makes there on 12 mm-hmm. to get a bogey because that's a great score. But the next drive, he sprays it into the trees on a, on a hole that he's got to get a birdie on. Absolutely. The point that I'm making is if he doesn't make the putt on 12, and he double bogeys, and he gets to four over there, I don't think his drive would have been better on 13. If he goes double bogey and then sprays a drive right on yes. a scoring hole par five, mm-hmm. it's over for him. So the the ability to keep it together on 12 enough after going into the water left him the availability to where those two birdies he made on 14 and 16 couldn't matter. Yes. And now, listen, we I said I would like him to shoot a 70. CC said a 69. Obviously, 73 is not what we were talking about. The last major champion, the last Masters champion to win the Masters, tied for 29th or worse after one round, which is where he is now, was Tiger in 2005 mm-hmm. when he actually shot 74. a 74 on day one. But we said, CC, he's got to score in the par fives. If he was one over but three under on par fives, I'd be more worried. The fact that he was one Mm -hmm. over, but even on the par fives, gives me a little more optimism for today and the fact that he was able to salvage his round. Have you just have you changed your outlook on what you think he can or will do this tournament just based on what you saw yesterday? You did come out yesterday and say Tiger tends, tends to be a little nervous and he gets a little cold on the first day. Was that just jitters, or do you think there's something else? Part of it's jitters, but playing the course in the morning, the temperature was not as warm as it was in the afternoon, basically 15 degrees different. The ball's going to fly further. That's why you saw guys at the end of the day scoring on that golf course. Now, Tiger's going to have the same opportunity. Now, does the weather, is the weather consistent? Because as Nick and I talked before, when you get in these majors, you can get a bad window of weather. Now, the sun was out. But it's only 48 degrees. So it's totally different than his afternoon tea time. Is the weather the same where the course is more gettable in the afternoon? The biggest problem is not only Tiger trying to manage getting enough birdies. Man, we got the world's best players playing. I told you someone would shoot five under with Jordan Spieth. He went six under. So you can't get too far behind because we know on the back nine, yes, you can score. People can shoot a potential 29 or 30 on the back. But, man, the best players are playing their best golf. And there are too many good players between Tiger and the lead in Jordan speed. So Tiger's back got to be able to cut that down. You can't wait to typical Saturday moving day. Got to go shoot a 67 he's, or better today. He's got he's to gotta play one of his best rounds of golf this season today. Tees off this morning? This afternoon. Awesome. Coming up, got that right. Conor McGregor is in police custody after yesterday's tirade. UFC President Dana White is here to discuss. That's still ahead here on First Things First. You know, if these two guys, my co-anchors, were Seinfeld fans, I'd remind them of the great Even Steven episode. You know, lose 20 bucks, find 20 bucks. Patriots love that episode. Lose a wide receiver, pick up a wide receiver. It's mm, just okay. that easy. You, got, that you see where I'm going now? Man, I got that. You got to okay. give me a little warning, though, because I'm not warning. big on the, uh, what's his name? I, what's his name? Seinfeld. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld. All right. On Wednesday, they said goodbye to Brandon Cooks. On Thursday, they said hello to Jordan Matthews. New England signed Matthews to a one-year deal yesterday. He struggled in Buffalo last season, only catching 25 balls and battling injuries all year. All right, CC. Seinfeld aside, how much will Matthews be able to replace the productivity that Brandon Cooks gave this Patriots team last year? Well, it's going to be hard to just replace the productivity with a guy who who is not necessarily an outside receiver. I mean, who is Jordan Matthews? He can play outside because he's got some height. Not a real speed receiver. I believe he's a possession receiver, and I and I and I take that as as a possession receiver. I don't I don't take that as a slight. It's what their skill set is. Brandon Cook, one of the fastest wide receivers that we've seen in the NFL as far as a starter, all right? You cannot replace the threat that he has on that offense. So now it makes me think he's a lot like when they acquired Chris Hogan two years ago. Now, he'll be playing with the best quarterback in his career, started his career in Philadelphia, and then went on over to Buffalo. Not, um, uh, didn't have the productivity there in Buffalo. That's how he ends up in New England. But them also signed him to a one-year deal. If he doesn't do well in the offseason, doesn't do well in training camp, they could cut him. So this is just a tryout. So before we get consumed with him being on the team, his skill set is he's a possession receiver, a lot like 
Um, Malcolm Mitchell, who they have, will be back from an injury, a lot like Hogan, who they got from Buffalo, who has been productive, but can play some in the slot. But he won't be able to replace Amendola, his productivity in the slot, or Brandon Cook, what he did outside. He is a better athlete than most of the Patriot receivers, and I don't say that for what some people would call the the obvious reason, but because at the Combine, he he was a stud at the Combine. Yes. Had more bench press reps than any yes. wide receiver. We're in a sub 4 5 40, had a 36-inch vertical. His measurables were really good at the Combine. That's really, I'm be honest, I know that about him. I know a few. I remember the trade last offseason when Buffalo got off Sammy Watkins. They then bring in Jordan Matthews. But you've, you've known Jordan since before yes. he was in the NFL. A lot of, when the Patriots make a move, it's a lot about play, but it's also a lot about personality, intelligence, yes. ability to pick up the offense. Now, he has all those things. Just tell us, tell us a little bit about Jordan Matthews, the guy. He, he has the him. temperament of a New England player. He's not a diva wide receiver. He's not a high maintenance. Very, very bright guy. Played college ball at Vanderbilt. Um, he will fit into the New England way. So he is a guy that potentially that Belichick likes to get. He's got a clean resume beside being injured as far as his character and everything off the field. It speaks to New England in the way they do things. And, man, they bring you there on a one-year tryout. Typically, they get the best from you. They like to be able to, be able to match some of the productivity that he had playing for Chip Kelly being a slot receiver because – New England typically doesn't go for a bigger slot receiver, and that's what Jordan would give them. That, to me, I believe is the change of pace that we could see there in New England. Does that mean the Patriots are done looking for help at wide receiver? Does, does he come in and, and replace Brandon I, Cooks? I think, and this is no disrespect to Jordan Matthews, I think the fact that he's the first guy they are able to sign shows you what type of help is out there. Like this, the fact that there there are no there are no oh wait well this solves it left mm -hmm. and by the way I don't think there's that in the draft either so like the whatever it's going to be either a guy who plays better than he had in any other place in his career or a guy who reclaims something from earlier in his career it's going to be that type of situation there are no B level or sure. higher players left in free agency at this point not at that position there's some safeties available but that's not what they seem to be targeting yeah it's it's really hard to replace the speed that Brandon Cook brought to the lineup. So for me, I wouldn't be shocked if they draft a wide receiver, but New England, what are the characteristics of the players they want? They like smart guys. They like guys who have played in the league, have experience, and they're pros. They know how to work within a pro, but also college graduates. Even though these guys are coming out of college, rookies haven't done well in New England's offense. All right, so to get someone like Jordan, that is a bonus compared to relying on someone coming out of this year's draft. All right, take a break. Coming up, Dana White will join us to let us know what actually happened last night with Conor McGregor. That's ahead on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. Chris Mannix joins us now. Hey, Chris. Well, what's what's happening? happening to you, man? I'm ready to declare the Celtics season over. Oh. oh. Well, it took someone. No. I'm ready. That's a better declaration than compared to the uh, one you should be saying. That's Nick Wright is right. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you, Cece. I like that. Yeah, I don't think he means if, that. If LeBron I, went see? down for the season, I'd be right. So that's oh, you know, I mean, it's, oh, uh, see how that works. It's semantics. That was it's semantics, Chris. It's semantics. semantics. All right, let's tell you what these guys are talking oh. about. The Celtics were dealt a blow yesterday when it was reported that their season is over. Well, specifically, they announced Kyrie Irving will miss the rest of the season, including the playoffs, because he needs additional surgery on his knee. So basically, their season is, for all intents and purposes, over. Kyrie only played 60 games for Boston this season, averaged 24 points, five assists per. The Celtics currently are sitting at the two seed and will play the Wizards if the season ended today, which it doesn't, so it was a throwaway sentence. <laughs> Chris, what does this mean for the future of the Boston Celtics? Oh, well, look, short term, it means their season is over. I mean, if they play Washington, they're not beating Washington in the first round. It's as simple as that. Long term, you have to start asking some serious questions here. Now, I know the narrative being pushed out by Boston. Every time they issue a press release on Kyrie Irving it includes some form of the sentence no structural damage in the knee the knee has healed fine this is about pain management this is about some a bacterial infection which I never heard by the way when it comes to something like this great could Kyrie Irving come back be fine next season yes the recovery time puts it right around August but this is his second major knee surgery in the last three years and Chris you played the game man I, I don't care how minor some of them are when you go into that knee, when you're yanking out screws, when you're cutting uh, wires in there, that's serious. So until Kyrie shows he can play 70-plus games in a full playoff after all this has happened, mm -hmm. 
I, you have to have guys questions. If there were people in Cleveland that were disappointed that they got Isaiah Thomas because he was damaged goods. That's why they went back and got compensation after the trade. But the word out of Cleveland that was communicated to me was Kyrie Irving's knee will never be the same after that injury that he had. And I asked you that. You were like, oh, Kyrie's going to come back. I said, aren't you worried about his knee? Because I know the people in Cleveland, long term, especially for guards, it's hard to have knee problems. It's hard to have a long career when you have problems with your wheels. We have seen it. Guards deteriorate faster. So for me, it's not about the playoffs, okay, because they didn't have Gordon. They weren't going anywhere anyway. But long term, I'm concerned about that. When they're trying to add that final piece, do they go after a Kawhi? Do they go after um, the Brow? Man, you got to be concerned about Kyrie Irving. As a guard with a knee like that, like, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm reading through the little details and everything. I would be concerned if I was a Boston Celtics fan. I believe it's more than just bacteria around the hardware that was placed in the knee. I got hardware in my foot. Just had an x-ray last month. Guy asked me if I wanted to leave the hardware in there. I said, well, I'm not going to be playing any basketball anytime <laughs> soon. But having that, having those screws in your knee or in your foot, they are not good long term. Well, and remember the Joe Varden report yep. from a couple months ago that said if the cat that Kyrie was prepared, if the Cavs didn't trade him to have knee surgery, that would put him out for the year. Now we have. And a when you were talking about this, you and I, I told you, Nick, there's something, some truth to that. Right. Because Nick thought they were just he was threatened just to hold him up. I was well, like, I, I don't know if it was for the year. I know he was going to have knee surgery before camp and not go to camp. The type of surgery they thought they were doing in Boston, which would tweak some things. See, so. I th so that's where I. Th think there's a slight disagreement because there what I what I've learned or what I understand I should say through other people's reporting I mm -hmm. haven't been doing the reporting is that the moment they put those screws in they told him at some point we're going to want to take these screws out mm -hmm. yes. and that's a surgery that will knock you out four to five months and it seems to me that that is the surgery he was according to Joe Varden's report threatening like okay you guys don't move me I need the surgery at some point anyway I can do it right now mm -hmm. as opposed to after mm -hmm. a season so the the upside the bright side if you will if there is one is he probably needed the surgery at some point anyway had he waited until after the season that delays the rehab yes. further into next season so mm -hmm. that part of it's good but the 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 negative part or the, there's obvious negative parts but the the procedural part of this is we're seeing, like I, I say it all the time, there's a reason teams don't go to four straight finals. There's a reason teams, it is hard to play that many hundred game seasons mm -hmm. that many years in a row. That intense. So, but guess what? Steph, he's having injury problems this year. Kyrie having injury problems this year. Kevin Love, not necessarily, I mean, he broke his hand, but he also had, a, I don't want to call it emotional problems, but he had his own issues dealing with stress and things like this. Like we have seen guys, it, it, there is no precedent for what the Cavs and the Warriors have been doing. And for Kyrie, listen, people think I don't like Kyrie. All I the hope guys Kyrie's that, healthy. All the guys that have been in those three series, for the most part, have been hurt. Mm -hmm. You go to Steph, Clay, Draymond, Draymond, Tristan, um, Tristan JR, everybody, so, except, except LeBron. LeBron. Yeah. So, Chris, let's get back to our original question. What does this mean for the future of the Boston Celtics now? Well, look, How they have – perspective? I mean, look, if he's not able to, to play at the highest of levels, if this continues to be an ongoing problem, don't, they don't have a championship window. Like I, I wrote last night, their championship window begins next year. It opens up to some degree next season when Hayward's back, when mm -hmm. Tatum and Brown are a little bit older. But if Kyrie Irving is dragging that knee around every All-Star break and needs procedures at various points during the season, they don't have a future. The question I would be asking, Nick, in the aftermath of that Joe Vard report. Now that we have all kind of the information here, why wasn't surgery done this offseason? If you know that this stuff, like if Joe Varden knows something, shouldn't the Celtics know something? Shouldn't it have, they have this information? If you believe, like you said, Chris, that these screws are coming out, mm -hmm. that this wire needs to be cut, why not do it in August as soon as you get him and then you get him back on the floor December, January? Fair questions I think yeah, need to be asked. Absolutely. All right, we've got to take a break now. Chris, we'll see you a little bit later in the show. Coming up, Dana White joins us to discuss all the chaos surrounding Conor McGregor. That's in three minutes right here. On I ain't Facebook. got my fighting clothes on. They better not start throwing stuff, Dana. <laughs> Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by UFC President Dana.
Dana White. Dana, thanks for stopping you, by. Thanks Thank for having you. me. You had a pretty show, bro. uneventful Good night, day. so we appreciate you just coming <laughs> over and hanging out with us this oh, morning. Oh, man. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, let's talk about it. Some crazy events. Brooklyn's tough, isn't it? At USC <laughs> 223 Media Day yesterday, Conor McGregor and members of his team showed up unexpectedly and threw multiple objects, including a guardrail at a bus full of UFC fighters. Conor was charged with three counts of assault, one count of criminal mischief. Three fights off the pay-per-view card were canceled as a result. So let's bring it out here. And Dana, I ask you, what have you learned after everything and the dust settled yesterday? What, what did you find out? Well, it was a, it was obviously a weird situation. All the fight, the thing was over, and the fighters were all getting on the buses and leave. leaving, leaving the yeah. arena and going back to the hotel. And uh, these guys had people on the inside who opened doors for them, um, who were there covering the event for his company and um, and came and attacked the buses. And, you know, when you see that, that dolly go through the window, yeah. Mike Chiesa, one of the fighters, is sitting right there. So the glass, and I believe the dolly hit him, you know, and, and uh, he was bleeding. And, and uh, then one of the other guys, Ray Borg, glass went in his eyes and actually cut his eyeballs. Yeah, and so he was off the card. So just right there, that's four people. And then Artem was with Connor uh, in doing this. And, uh, you know, Connor turned himself in last night to police. Um, they, uh, they, they, they had a warrant for his arrest or were working on a warrant for his arrest. I don't know if mm -hmm. what, what actually ended up happening. But they did ground his plane. They, they grabbed his passport. They did. So that he couldn't, you know, tagged his passport or out, right. however it is they do it. And, uh, you know... It was either wait for the police to catch him or him to turn himself. Dana, away. now when we first saw this, first saw the report, uh, as sports fans, uh, initially, not, not alarming, but is is this staged? Is this real? Now, oh, yeah. much respect to you, Dana. Now you've been involved in a lot of different things <laughs> from a promotional standpoint and very very successful at it. We've never seen anything like this. Right. Where does this sit with you? This last the, night. This is the fight business, and. Leading up the week of a fight, there's tension and animosity. Guys are cutting weight. Um, they're angry. You know, these type of things happen. Guys will say things, push, shove, grab each other. These things have happened. Slap. People have slapped each other. People have done this. We can deal with all that stuff. When you bring in, you know, 20 hoodlums, they flew in from Ireland to basically do this um, at our event. It's, uh, like I said, there's nothing... I like this that has ever happened. Connor as well flew in from he, Ireland. He flew them in. He's the he flew one. them all in on a yeah. private jet. They all flew in to do this. So, so here's. So, is this? Do you have any idea? Is this out of anger about the the scuffle at the hotel? Is this because yes. he's? It's not about being stripped of his belt. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with him being stripped. This was. So what to tell people? Artem, Artem Labov, who is on the uh, undercard, yeah. is a very, very close friend of Conor McGregor. And uh, he got into an altercation mm -hmm. with Habib Nurmagomedov and his team. So when Connor found out about it, he loaded up a plane full of guys from Ireland, flew over here, and you know coordinated this this attack on the buses. And and obviously, there's multiple problems with doing something like this. But the biggest problem, in, in, in my opinion, both of these buses are full of a ton of fighters and their cornermen. And they're just throwing things up into the windows with, with not caring who they hit. They hit Mike Kies. Mike Kies has nothing to do with this. You know what I mean? Rose Namajunas was right there. She has nothing to do with this. And many of the other fighters and cornermen have nothing to do with this situation. And they didn't care. They attacked them all. Have you spoken to Connor? Do you plan to speak to Connor? Have you spoken to his people? Where are you with that? Connor and I talked through text yesterday. Um, Probably the obvious worst conversation we've ever had, um, but yeah, w we talked yesterday before he turned himself Wait, in. Wait, worst conversation? Yeah. It was well, you mean that he didn't understand what had happened? No, I, I don't believe he did. Or the severity I, well, it's not of what that, happened? It's not that I don't think he understood what happened. It just he justified it. He had it, it was justified to him that uh, you know, listen, I'm sorry about Mike, and I'm sorry about Rose and whoever else might have whatever, but this had to be done. So the, when you say this, his issue was with Abib, right? Right. He, 
he is in one of the only industries in the world where if you have an issue with someone, you not only are you allowed to punch them in the face <laughs> right. repeatedly, you You're can make encouraged. millions of dollars to punch right. them in the face repeatedly. Like, so I, I, I'm not asking you to get in his head, but it, it, like, why, why was there the inability, in your opinion, to just say, okay, now I have real animosity towards a guy, and by the way, you didn't want to strip him of his belt. You'd rather him be right. fighting anyway. Yes. Let's just make, I, I can maybe show up, I can be in the crowd, I can get the, get the buzz started. And then set up a fight. Like, w why not that route, the logical route? Yeah, uh, that you're, you're, you're asking the same questions that I'm asking. And that's what I said yesterday. If you have a problem with somebody in this business, we can handle it. You can literally fight them and, and do whatever, you know, within the, the rules yeah. of, of fighting, you, you, can, you can do that. And um, that's absolutely what should have been done. You're talking about one of the biggest superstars globally in all of sports. And um, it, it doesn't get any worse than this. Does he have a future with you? Um, I don't, I don't, I honestly sitting here right now, people keep asking me, are you going to fire him? Are you going to fire him? This is way bigger than are you going to fire a guy? This, this is, uh, this is criminal. This is uh, other fighters. You know, we're, some of our staff, one of our staff, mm -hmm. uh, one of our security broke guys, his knuckles. yeah, broken knuckle, um, was punched repeatedly by guys. You know, th these type of. Th we have the whole footage. We have the footage from the cameras that were shooting uh, UFC embedded, mm -hmm. cameras from inside and outside, and the uh, the arenas. So, so we we literally have everything. Dana, I want to go back to something you said. You're, you're the seemingly the only person that's spoken to Connor since this mm -hmm. has happened. You said he justified it. Did, did he explain anything to you that you didn't know before or that surprised you at all as to why he did this or why he doesn't think what he did was was so awful? Nothing. Really? Nothing. Obviously, we didn't have a good conversation yesterday, and it wasn't really about um, wasn't really about the situation. He felt that my interview on on uh, ESPN yesterday and. Uh, MMA junkie, you yeah. did something with that. Yeah, and, and the Las Vegas Review Journal were all there when I after this thing, and and uh, he wasn't happy with my interview and, and some of the things that I said, and uh, so we got into it more about that than him really. You know, they feel like these guys attacked his friend, and this needed to be done. When you go ahead, Cece. No, I, obviously, the message you weren't able to get that to Conor McGregor. But Nick, myself, Jenna, we're fans of UFC. We're a fan of Dana White. What kind of message do you have to us and other people here in the New York tri-state area? You have a big event tomorrow night. Yeah. What's the message to us as consumers of your product? Yeah, listen, uh, unfortunately, these things happen in all sports. I mean, uh, there's been huge fights that have spilled mm -hmm. out into the crowd in NBA and, um, you know, soccer, and the list goes on and on. And... They obviously caught us at a moment when, first of all, everybody's gone. The fighters are the last to leave. Everybody's getting on the bus. And if you watch the video, the long video, which I'm sure will be out soon, uh, the security staff that we did have there stopped them from throwing bike racks, uh, garbage cans. The list goes on and on. The dolly and a, and a chair, I think, hit the bus. The mm -hmm. dolly went through the window. But... They did, the, the, the limited security staff that was there did a fantastic it, job. And, you know, 15 years, almost 20 years of me doing this and 25 years of the UFC, nothing like this has ever happened. Right. You it, know, it, not in the crowd, not anywhere. What, what do you think, and listen, I promise you we're going to talk about the actual event that's happening, But because I know that's, that's the original reason you came here. It's a huge event tomorrow, even though some of the fights now aren't going to be yeah, able to go that on. That you were scheduled to come. Regardless of this, and yes, it's, it's right. great of you to, to come anyway, but there's, do you, was the, was the objective to get Abib off the bus? And if that happens? No, no, no. The, the object, oh, him? For Connor? For Connor. Yeah. I, know, I, I think the objective I mean, 20... was to get to Abib. Our objective was to keep everybody on the bus and defuse this mm -hmm. thing. Um, and like I said, our limited security staff that was there, three or four guys. Hell of a job by then. I mean, because it it's, it's not just, it's Connor and I would assume a lot of other trained professional fighters. Right. But, exactly. so, I, but, but you're talking about trained professional fighters that are in a completely different state of mind. These guys are cutting weight. The weigh-ins are today. So these guys are right in the middle of weight cut. You know, they're tired. They have to get back and, and, and keep working on cutting the weight. Um, completely different state of mind, this group of fighters, 
that were on that bus. I just want to follow up one thing you said. You said Connor wasn't happy with, with something. It was some of the things you said in the interview. I would imagine one of those is you said you're like, listen, I don't know if he was on drugs. I don't know. One hundred percent. Yeah, that that was a big, that was, was upset about. Yeah. yeah. But but when you see the guy run in and do what he did, what do you want me to think? What do you want me to think? This this is completely irrational behavior. Um, you're, 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 you're a professional athlete. You make millions of dollars a year, and uh, you're one of the biggest superstars on planet Earth. Millions play. because of you, though. Yeah, millions, did, did he forget that? Millions because of both of us. He is a very talented guy. I have done my job, obviously. Uh, he listen, has done his. Do we know we Conor McGregor his. without Dana White? No. Okay? <laughs> Let's thank stop you. that well, mess. Thank you. All right. Dana, <laughs> what, what options do you have right now? What are the choices and decisions you have to make over the course of the next 24, 48 hours Obviously, in regards to this? we're focused right now on the event, okay. security, and all these things as, as far as the event goes right now. Get this event behind me. Obviously, my whole crew is out here now from Vegas, lawyers and everybody else. We were on conference calls all night last night. And once this thing's over, we get back to, to Vegas and, and, and figure out what's next. I wonder if he realizes how much trouble he's in. Trouble's seemingly a mundane word, but ha how severe this is. I agree with you. I, I agree. I, I, yesterday, I don't think he did. Today, I think he's in jail right now. He might. And, uh, you know, not just the legal stuff that's, uh, that's going on, uh, you know, criminal stuff mm -hmm. that he's yeah. being the charged with. The civil part of it. The civil lawsuits oh, that's that are coming next. Yeah. I mean, against for I mean for anyone and everyone. Listen, I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer on television, but I would imagine the UFC has a claim. Barclays might have a claim. Half dozen fighters, everyone the fighters, on the card, yeah, sure. even people not injured. Security, like, security. The I mean, there's there's a lot of people. And by the way, sometimes you sue a guy that you know has no money. Sometimes right. you sue a guy that you know has a ton of money. Right. And those results are different. So, all right. So listen, what's left of the lineup, and then we can talk about the main event. Like you mentioned. Yeah. The well. Part. I mean, the main event is still intact. The co-main event is still intact. And most of the other fights that, that you know, the big fight, you know, it, it, it bummed us out losing Chiesa versus uh, Pettis. It, it was a yeah. good fight. Um, we'll, we'll make it up to those guys and put them on a card here soon. But the main event, co-main event, and many of the other fights that people want to see are still on. So what should people, if people don't know Habib, if they don't know Max Holloway, what should we, what should they be looking for? Well, Max Holloway is the 145-pound champion. He hasn't lost in five years. Uh, you know, the, the, the guy has the, the most finishes in, in the 145-pound division history up against Habib, who is undefeated, 25-0, who many people feel uh, is the best fighter in the world right now. And uh, Max Holloway is a stud, stepped up and took this fight on six days' notice because this, this started on Sunday for us, this uh, right. This nutty week that we're having, uh, you know, our, our guy Tony Ferguson got hurt, was doing PR and tripped over one of the wires and oh. tore his uh, LCL off the bone doing PR. Oh. So people who think PR isn't dangerous, uh, <laughs> Tony, you Tony the proved UFC that was wrong. Dangerous. What, what Public about, relations is the worst. about the <laughs> What's that? Tell us about Oh, the co-main event is Rose Namajunas versus uh, Joanna Yon Jacek. Yon Jacek's only loss is to Namajunas. And uh, the first fight was incredible. It was at Madison Square Garden. This is the rematch. Uh, uh, Ro I mean, uh, Joanna was on her way to break Ronda Rousey's uh, streak for title defenses, and Rose came and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and ruined that for her. Is Rose doing okay? She walked back to the hotel, right? She's she wasn't not. physically injured, right? But she no. was, but she so, was shaken so by everything. Apparently, the bus was backing up, and when this thing came through, she was right there. And uh, I don't know. I guess glass just exploded into the into the van, and all of it went right by her face. And you know, again, yeah. these these fighters are cutting weight. They're in a real but Different she's state of fight. mind. Yeah, she was shaken up. She was upset. She left and walked back to the hotel when everybody told her not to. And uh, I went and sat with her, and I think she's good. Danny, you've got a lot on your plate. We really appreciate the time today, both with the event coming up, plus everything you're going to, the fallout from everything you're going to have to deal with. But you've been wonderful talking to us, and you helped explain a lot. So we thank you so much. For Thanks for having me. Thank good luck so with much. everything. And the prelims are on FS1. So yes. So people can check absolutely. all that out before the paper. Absolutely. take a break. Then we'll right you know back. how we do it. I need two after this. on the camera side. <laughs> <laughs> so when they pay the fighters, I'm right there. You know how we do it. <laughs> I got it overexcited. Yeah, you did. Uh, there's a reason the Cavs are never out of a game in which LeBron James plays. He's that good. Last night was proof. Cleveland trailing 17 to the Wizards with just over seven to play.
on head coach Ty Lue's first night back from sick leave. LeBron said he wanted Ty Lue to get the win, so guess what? Oh, he just went out and got Ty Lue the win. Scored 13 of his 33 in the fourth. Cavs winners of 10 of 11. Here's LeBron after the game on his mentality in that fourth quarter. Well, you know it's time on the clock. So, you know, I don't, I don't have a quit uh, bone in me. You know, so if I'm on the floor, I got to try to make plays happen no matter what the score is. And, you know, it's just my mindset. With the way LeBron was so instrumental in that fourth quarter comeback, what's there left to say about what he's done this season? Stop point shaving the first three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> about to give me a heart attack, man. Like, just if you play like that from the jump, we win by 20 something. Jenna, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what day is it today? Today's Friday. Hmm, why is that? Ma oh, Chris Mannix said, talk to me Friday. Didn't care that the Cavs beat down the Raptors. Talk to me Friday after they play Washington. Well, it's Friday. To be specific, I said, wake me up after they beat the Wizards. Okay. And, and I got about a dozen texts late last, <laughs> or tweets late last night from people saying, are, are you awake? Are you awake? Are you awake? <laughs> are you awake? I'm, I'm awake. I get yes. it. Your, th but, your look, thoughts on what you saw. Okay. Le there's nothing more you can say about LeBron James. He he's offensively, this is the best season of his career. Mm -hmm. He's playing brilliant basketball. How he was able to pull their fat out of the fire of the fourth quarter last night, it was nothing short of remarkable. And the mental edge that LeBron has on so many of these teams, yes. it's something to watch because Washington, it's real. Has, he's, they've been blitzed by LeBron going back to like Gilbert Arenas days. Mm -hmm. um, Toronto, you know, we know their history with LeBron. That mental edge is going to be huge for them. But I don't know how you can watch that game and declare it a wrap and declare like, oh, the Cavs are, are a lock to go to the finals. What was the third? What were the third quarter numbers? What was it, like thirty six to, to? Oh, it was something? brutal in the third quarter. I know that at one point Washington was on a fifty eight twenty eight right, run. Right. And, and look, fifty eight twenty eight. It was run. it was absurd. And can you can you just say without a shadow of a doubt that that's not going to happen in in the? Oh uh, no no no! I think it'll happen a lot in the postseason, and then that'll happen. That's the thing is, as long as they let you play the four quarters, can he play that flawlessly every game of the postseason? Here's what I, say, I would say to you, Nick. Wasn't even that good of a game for LeBron, but the way uh, he's the been playing. Last four minutes. Last 30, four minutes were unbelievable. Yeah, but 33-9-14 on sixty percent. Yeah, it's about what I expect from him. He, each here's night. just the one thing. The one thing you have to remember about LeBron in the playoffs. There's no margin for error for him in this postseason. In the past, no. there that have. That is correct. Yes. In the past, there have been margins for errors. You go back to, we've talked about this, game Big four, facts. conference finals last year when LeBron went out with foul trouble. They needed Kyrie Herb Irving to have the second half of his life mm -hmm. to avoid going back to Boston 2-2. They probably win that series anyway, but who cares? Well, there's no way LeBron can get into foul trouble. There's no way LeBron can have a bad fourth quarter. If he does, they lose that Man, game. Even to your point, with him playing amazing, if they don't get those two stops at the end, I mean, because because not to mention oh, LeBron's free throw sequences. Horre like John Wall, would you stop with the mid-range jump shots? Like, I mean, they, they're moving stop. the ball. They're scoring. They're doing what they want to do offensively. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to take them by myself. I'm going to make this personal. No, I mean, if they get one bucket at the end, you're, you, you are right. LeBron's margin. That's a fact. Now, that's not that's not a big enough fact for Nick to be concerned. Not yet. But brilliant LeBron still at the end, because this team doesn't have, to me, they don't have that other guy like Kyrie. I believe that LeBron's stronghold over the East, though, that is real, and that will play out. But these other guys, that's why I tell you, Nick, down the stretch, these other guys making shots and having good results with LeBron, it's important because they haven't seen that. And but so far, it hasn't been consistent. So far, it's been LeBron, Kevin Love, and maybe this guy. LeBron, Kevin Love, and maybe well, that's that the guy. Thing. They're still, haven't had they're still changing their rotation they don't have a right now. They decided yeah. to, to yesterday that it's going to be Kevin Love and Jeff Green in the front court for the rest of the season. Like, yeah. th these are not th – this Some is not played stability. one game with their full what, lineup. 79 games? 80 games? 79 70, games. 79 games. 29 – Different start. Now, I'll give LeBron credit for that. In playing all these games, 29 different starting lineups. Like, that is, man, that is hard to get the type of results that they have. And, all right, so let's talk about what you just said. Margin, right. margin of error, <laughs> right? Because the Cavs, since LeBron's been back in Cleveland, they've played nine series against Eastern Conference opponents. Six of those have been sweeps. 
Two of those have gone, one of those has gone five games. Two of those have gone six games. The minimum amount of games you can play to get to the NBA Finals is 12. They have played 14, 14, and 13 in his three years back. So even if the margin is smaller, and even if Toronto's better, you still have an enormous gulf to bridge, which I don't see it being bridged. But what people have to stop doing in their Cavs analysis is this part of it. Well, what happens when LeBron isn't that good? Man, when's the last time LeBron wasn't that good in the playoffs? The last time LeBron was not that level of good in the playoffs was the Dallas series in 2011. That was almost seven years ago. Like, we, we have to worry about every player in the league. What if they have an off night in the playoffs? It happens to Steph. It happens to Katie. It happens to Harden. It happens to Russ. It has not happened to LeBron. He has but not besides had- Russ, though, he's got the least amount of support. Like, that's real. I would I would agree with you that he has the least amount of support. He is also that much better than everybody else. And what his ability, what was most impressive to me about late in that game, and this is why in any spot he can do this, and Ty Lu says, why wouldn't he do it the whole time? And I, I know our pal Skip was saying, why wouldn't he do it the whole time? The answer is because it's exhausting. Because you can't, you can't right. play you can't. like that for 44 minutes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not a decent argument. The, the, it's just like, yes. I know, you, just, you yes. can't do that. It's not, it's not fair to ask anyone. But what LeBron can do that none of the other players in the league can do is dominate the game from the scoring and passing aspect. The play to Jeff Green, where he's looking, he's seeing, he sees Jeff Green cutting. He knows he's making the fake pass there. You tweeted, you were like, the way he can dominate the game, game. just seize the game, is Mm -hmm. unlike anything you said in the NBA today. I would say, other than Magic Johnson, NBA history. Like, that is what you're going to get from LeBron in the postseason. And I know people are going to come out and say, oh, well, now with Kyrie Hurt and all these things. I, I, we have to be fair here. The big team all year long that people were saying would challenge Cleveland was Toronto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Toronto is fully healthy. Yes. So, like, people... But it wasn't just Toronto what they were doing. It's the overall lack of continuity, and everything that was going on in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So it's just not, oh, Toronto's going to be – it's also the smoke that was coming out of Cleveland. That's that's it. Like, two things you said there. One, the the numbers from the last three years since LeBron's been back in Cleveland are utterly meaningless right now. Completely meaningless because Kyrie Irving's not there. Because they're trotting out whether it's Jose Calderon or George Hill instead of Kyrie Irving. The other thing you said was that, you know, you kind of walked over the line that, yeah, the gap has closed or the margin for error is smaller. The margin for error went from the distance between you two sitting here at the desk and like this. It's paper thin for LeBron James and that team. He doesn't play well, they lose. That wasn't the case in the past. Plus, as we just talked about, the Eastern Conference, the top-tier teams, so obviously Boston's out of it, mm-hmm. but Toronto, they're much better. Philadelphia, they're going to be tough. I think Washington, once Wall gets into a rhythm, is going to be tough for them in the playoffs. I, I think this is going to be the most challenging postseason of LeBron James's career. Will he? Do you think the Cavs will play a single elimination game in the Eastern Conference playoffs. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. It might not be more than one. It might not be more than one, but I think they play one. Look, and that's not a knock on them. People take the, me saying the Cavs suck, but it's not. No. Look, the Warriors did. The Warriors play one just two no, years no, ago. No, no, your, like, your analysis play. of the Cavs is true. They're not as good as they were. This season, LeBron struggled more than any other season in Cleveland. That's just... That, those are things that we saw in, in 79 games. Yeah. It's not like we just pulled that out of a hat. You know what we've also seen in 79 games? They're going to win the same amount or more games than they did last year with Kyrie. My, my projection, biggest game of the season for the Toronto Raptors is going to be game one of the conference finals against Cleveland. If Toronto better the get there. It's right. No, but Toronto better get there. But Toronto, they need to get. They need to take a lead on the Cavs. They can't lost keep 10 playing from behind. Game ones. They, exactly. They can't keep playing from behind. Not against Cleveland. Big, uh, big game for Great Cleveland job, tonight. They're Thank taking you. on the Sixers. Should yep. be a fun one. Wake me after that. One. <laughs> okay. Wake me after. Man, that I'm one. very <laughs> tired. Okay. Tonight. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Coming up, Steve Kerr has some harsh words for his own team after. The the oh, now. And by the people next on all the cards. Uh, on to the Masters. Tiger Woods shot a one over 73, finished seven strokes behind the day. The day one leader. Woods had an up and down round, struggled to birdie any of the par fives. Tiger hoping to secure his fifth green jacket on Sunday. Chris Carter, how should Tiger feel after this round, after round one? I know mentally he's glad he's back on tour. He's glad he's back at Augusta competing. He's also glad that a little past midway through the round, 
hole number 11, when he hits that drive off to the right um, that we're watching now, that he was able to salvage those next 30 minutes because he went on to make bogey there. Then he went on to hit the ball in the water on the par three number 12 because he talked about it in his interview. He's glad he didn't let the round go. This could have been a yeah. 76, 77 because Augusta yesterday with the wind and being inconsistent, Tiger felt like he's glad that he didn't get shoot himself out of the tournament. He still got a chance. Today is a huge day for him. Though. Last time he won the Masters, he shot a 74 in round one. Yes. We were hoping he would shoot around a 70. He obviously wasn't able to do that, but CeCe's right. When he hit the ball in the water, then it's a very tough, CeCe educated me on this, it's a very tough drop because of the elevation change. I didn't think it was a good chip shot, given how difficult it was. Maybe it was a decent, not chip shot, but a decent wedge shot. Yes. I that was a very – that was the, to me, the most critical putt of his that round. That was clutch. To make sure it was a bogey and not a mm -hmm. double bogey. We saw that at the uh, the turn – the Valspar, I think it was. Tough to recover from the big numbers. Tough to recover from the double bogeys and such. Listen, what we've seen when he's won the Masters, 66, 66, 69, 66 in round two, he's going to need a sub-68 score today to be in it. Somewhere 5-6 under to be back in this thing. And finally, the Warriors fell to the Pacers 126-106 last night. Golden State had three of their four All-Stars back from injury. Still missing Steph Curry, though. But Steve Kerr wasn't using Steph's absence as an excuse. Listen to this. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I mean, I know that this game doesn't mean anything in the seeding. The playoffs start next week. It was an embarrassing effort, pathetic effort. They did speak to Kevin Durant after the game who said it wasn't pathetic. We could have played better. We did play with heart. We actually did try. We just didn't win. They got blown out by like 20 points last night. Yeah. Nick, what do you make of Steve Kirk calling out his team? Man, so I, I had this game on. This was the first mm -hmm. game to start last night. A bunch yep. of 8 o'clock starts, a couple 10.30 starts. This game was the only game on for an hour, the only game of note on for an hour. So I'm watching it like, listen, the what I make of what's going on with the Warriors is simple. It, I know KD does not necessarily want to have to be a leader. I think one of the reasons he went to Golden State was because he doesn't want that responsibility. He wants to play ball. Like, he's made very clear in all his interviews, listen, man, I like playing ball. Yep. I like occasionally the maybe. The leadership that they had in Golden State was, was the perfect situation for him. With Draymond being the bad guy, Steph being the one who was cool and collected, and also going to be kind of the vocal leader besides Draymond on the team. You see how Clay sits in, cool right. Clay. He don't have to do nothing but knock down Jays, and he right. is totally fine with that. But his decision was based on these things and how the, the atmosphere in Golden State with Steve Kerr is very relaxed. The practices, they play music, very different atmosphere than other NBA teams. That's why, part of the reason why he selected Golden so State. So I, I, I respect that. He's, well, he said, I want to play ball and play video games. Cool. Like, you, you, that, that's a great life you have. But right now, they need you more than that. Yeah. And if they, you might as well arrested everyone last night. You might as well have. I know it didn't mean anything for the seedings, but Draymond still played 30 minutes. Clay yes. still played 30 minutes. KD still played 33 minutes. Like, mm -hmm. they, you should have, sh and that was, by the way, I know you're not going to play Indiana in the playoffs, but Indiana has some similarities to some teams you could play in the first round, whether it be Utah, whether it be Minnesota. Mm -hmm. whether, and so that you don't want that going into the postseason. The last thing, CC, you've talked about, the gravity Steph has, how important Steph is to the offense as a whole. You are seeing this with what has happened to Draymond's offense with Steph out. With Steph out, mm -hmm. Draymond is closely guarded instead of having wide open shots, and his offense is suffering from it. So that's something to watch in the first round of these playoffs. All right, let's move on to the NFL. Last season, it was reported that Texans owner Bob McNair had made a comment saying, quote, we can't have the inmates running the prison in reference to protests during the national anthem. Well, now McNair has regrets, not about making the comment, but about apologizing for the comment. McNair told the Wall Street Journal, the main thing I regret is apologizing. I really didn't have anything to apologize for. We were talking about a number of things, but we were also washing some of our dirty linen which you do internally. You can't do that publicly. That's what I was addressing, the relationship of owners and the league office. Nick, start with you. What was your reaction to these comments? Bob McNair needs to stop talking publicly. I mean, that's, that's my immediate reaction. My immediate reaction is he is doing no one any favors by continuing to do these interviews.
I am not someone that gives a pass because he's 80 years old. He's, I, 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 I know plenty of older folks. Heck, that we just had my wife's grandparents in studio last week. They're almost 90. They got it all together. He hasn't passed on control of his team. He's got it all together. He knows what he's saying. And he not only said that, and, by, and he, he insulted other people's intelligence. He's like, listen, maybe they're not familiar. This is a term used in the business world a lot. No, it's not. No. The term is inmates running the asylum. It's about crazy people, not about criminals. So when you say inmates running the prison, and you're talking about an overwhelmingly black league protesting treatment by the police of oh, no, black people. Oh, no, Nick, I wasn't people. talking about them. I was talking about Park Avenue, Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell making $35 million. That's who I was talking about. That's, is, that's an insult to my intelligence. It is also an insult to a friend of mine in this interview, Dwayne Brown. Dwayne Brown is one of the most respectable players in this league, a leader on each team he's been on, a leader in the community. And Dwayne Brown said that, Dwayne Brown, keep in mind, he held out last year with the Texans. That was about a contract dispute. Mm -hmm. And then he also, he commented on Bob McNair's comments when he was a Texan. He got traded to Seattle. And he said that Bob McNair, post the election of President Obama, said to the team what a bad day it was. Bob McNair called him a liar. I've spoken with Bob McNair before in my life. I've spoken a lot with Dwayne Brown in my life. I do not know Dwayne Brown to be a liar. I, I can say I believe what Dwayne Brown said. So that means I do not believe what Bob McNair said. And my last point on this is this, CC. The team owners need to recognize. They, are, they, they say they are worried about the protests, not because they disagree with the protests, but because it could affect the bottom line. It turns off the consumer. It turns off the audience. Amen. Amen. There is a segment of your audience very turned off by what Bob McNair said. There are people that, that kneel in solidarity with the Texans, or even if they don't, they, they, they believe in the player's right to do so. And hearing these types of, uh, these types of, in my eyes, indefensible comments makes, whether it be players less likely to want to sign there, fans less likely to want to go to the games, or people less likely to want to watch the games, that's all a real thing. All yeah. the things you're saying the kneeling is doing, these comments are doing. Um, Bob McNair, to, to add to that, Bob McNair supported Jerry Richardson for the things that he did and said, the workplace problems, the environment that he created there in Carolina. Bob McNair said, oh, oh you know, he, he, he didn't really mean that. <laughs> so you can't depend on Bob McNair. It, it, it's really disappointing because I, I just think that Houston fans – and the players should take note. This is who your owner is. All right? This is who he is. This is what he stands for. And this is what he's about. Now, when he came into the National Football League, he didn't have no finance plan. He asked them how much it was. It was $550 million. He brought out his checkbook, didn't have an entourage of people with him in the ownership meeting, filled out the check, and slid it across. Now, that don't make him no genius. That just makes him rich. And to me, it just makes him naive and rich. Because in the environment that we're in, he had an opportunity. He could have level set everything. Yeah, those comments right there, even though they used to be comments that I used to use, I realize right now how offensive they are. But he really doesn't see that. This is who he is. Houston Texans, this is who your, this is who your owner is. Fans, this is who your owner is. The players that play for the Texans, or anyone ever might, might want to play for the Texans, this is the guy who owns your team. Don't think he's going to change. And the reason why he's not, not going to change is because it's hard for rich people to change. All right? It's hard for them, and you could see that in his comments. And there's one other comment he made, which I think, even if people don't like the inmates running the prison comment, they might have read in the Wall Street Journal interview and say, oh, he makes a good point, which was, he was like, we don't let employees express their political views when they're at work. We, and he used the example, someone goes to McDonald's, the McDonald's would never let their employee hand them the burger and be like, you shouldn't eat meat. Or add some political opinion. Why do you have that Hillary bumper sticker or Trump bumper sticker, whatever it is? What he is, I, I believe, smart enough to know why that does not hold in his workplace. And sometimes you have to remind the fans. Professional football, the players and the owners, have a collectively bargained agreement. That is not the regular workplace you work in unless you work mm -hmm. in an environment with a collectively bargained agreement. Neither side can set any rules 
or parameters that are outside of the collectively bargained agreement. So unless you have agreed what the players must do in that agreement, regards to the anthem, regards to kneeling, regards to anything that you deem a political protest rather than a social justice protest, you need to collectively bargain it. Go back to the table and talk to DeMaurice Smith. Talk to union leadership. Until then, man, this is your bed you've made. You lie in it. And like, and I don't know, I used to live in Houston. I was some of my closest friends are day one PSL holders. I know what Bob McNair had meant to that city. He brought football back to Houston. I mean, Houston doesn't need this uh, representing them. Houston, the people of Houston are too good of people to have this guy talking on behalf of the city because he doesn't. All right, take a break. More First Things First after this. Welcome back to First Things First. We welcome in Chris Caney to the show. Good Hi, morning, Chris. Jenna. How, How you are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. great. Had a good night. I'm having a good morning. How was your night? And then subsequently, how was your uh, morning? My night was a little rough. My Yankees took the L last night against the Orioles. Wasn't a great outing for us. Mm -hmm. Bullpen let us down again. Come on, Chad Green. Come on, Chad Green. We need bullpen letting you down could be. Yeah. I'm sorry. The, starting, on, the bullpen should be good. Thing. The starting the rotation. The bullpen has not been thing. good. It's supposed to be the best that's bullpen saying, in the major be leagues. Good, right? their, their ERA is 665. There you go. That's there, a problem. You know. You know what that wow. sounds that's like. That's a problem. That sounds like a man that hosts a New York City radio show. Oh yeah. That's you know. Right. You know. You know base, bullpen, you know, hey, listen. Right. You know baseball moves the needle in New York. They are passionate New Yorkers about their baseball. All right. Let's move on to the other sport Chris Canny is passionate about. The Giants and the NFL draft plans for them. They hosted NC State defensive end Bradley Chubb yesterday and will host running back Saquon Barkley over the weekend. Lots of options with that second overall pick, including drafting Eli Manning's replacement or trading down for more picks. Lots to discuss here. Chris, what do you think the Giants should do with that number two pick? Well, I talked to somebody in the organization, and they said that uh -oh. the, Giants, the Giants like one quarterback in this draft. Now, they didn't mention who that quarterback was. I'm just going to assume it's Sam Donald because, to me, out of the top four quarterback prospects he has the highest floor but if the Giants don't have their guy sitting there at two then I can understand them deciding to trade down with somebody like Buffalo and acquire picks or one of those other teams that's trying to move up to get one of those other three quarterbacks that would be left on the board but to me the Giants pick is the pivot point in this draft because we know that the Cleveland Browns are going to take a quarterback at one. We know the New York Jets moved up to three to take a quarterback. So really a lot about what happens in the top five or six picks in this draft depends on what the Giants do at two. But in looking at the prospects that will be available, I don't understand how the Giants could justify taking a running back or a position player like Quentin Nelson or Bradley Chubb, seeing as how they have a 37-year-old quarterback and they're going to have to find a successor for him sooner rather than later. You're not going to be in this position if everything goes according to plan very often. So take advantage of a historically bad season with 13 losses yeah. and draft the quarterback, somebody that can be that franchise guy for the next 10 to 12 years. Stabilize that position, you stabilize the franchise. Now, I read something yesterday that the grades on the top four quarterbacks are the highest that we've seen in the NFL are the grades over 90. We've had four of them. It's the yeah. most grades over 90 that we've seen for quarterbacks in, in, in a long time. So I could understand why the Giants, they're not going to be in this position. And you also have to, well, if the quarterbacks weren't there, or would they be forcing it? But the quarterbacks are there. Eli is not going to get any younger. So I would be comfortable with them selecting, selecting a quarterback with number two. I'd also be comfortable with them going with Chubb on the defense because when the Giants have been good, it's because they can put pressure on the quarterbacks. We know that they, in their, in their, in their heyday, the Giants are an all-weather football team. So that makes us think, well, is he talking about Barkley now? I think that that should be the last player. Even though I'd love to see him, offensive player, I'd love to see him and Odell being in the same offense. But moving forward, if they don't go for a quarterback, they have to get Chubb as the defensive end to be able to be a bookend on that defense to put pressure on quarter. We know NFL, it's either about the quarterback, protecting the quarterback, or getting to the quarterback. Barkley is a tremendous player. But where the Giants are right now, it just becomes more important either to solidify your future or to let's put, let's put plans on being a great defense, which they've had most of their success in franchise history. I, I agree almost 100% with what you said, Chris. I think, there's, I think their very best option is to take their quarterback. 
I think the next best option is to trade back, get a bunch of picks. I think you and I, I'll lay out exactly what I think they could get if they do trade back. Mm -hmm. I think their worst option potentially is to take best position player available because, in my eyes, to get the value there, it has to be what Dave Gettleman said. Go get a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take a non-quarterback at number two, he has to be demonstrably better than the next best player at his position. Demonstrably better than some of these other guys that are going to go nine or 12 or 15. Mm -hmm. And so, I listen, you guys know I like Josh Rosen. I understand why they would like Sam Darnold. I'm not going to sit here and say this is the quarterback they have to take. I think they should take a quarterback. But if they don't want to, if they want with this new regime to be as competitive as possible this year, people talk about, well, they could get 12 and 22 from Buffalo for number two. They will get more than that. Mm -hmm. Like, it, we have seen when a team moves up from, think about what Chicago gave up just to move from three to two. If you're moving up from 12 to two, you're going to have to give up more than just the 22nd pick. You're probably going to have to either give up your high first, second rounder this year or your first rounder next year. Now we're talking about adding three players. And if you need that D end, at 12, Marcus Davenport, the second best pass rusher in this draft, should be there. If you want the running back, Darius Geis, the second best running back in this draft, could be there at 22. Like, I, I think if you don't take a quarterback, trading back and getting three quality players for a team that will have Odell back, I believe, yeah. run it back with three Eli, starters. three starters, like for a team that needs a lot, and you need cheap players in New York because yes. you've spent so much money on that defense, you just spent a ton of money on left tackle, like that makes sense to me. And you got some contract extensions that you're probably going to have to deal with sooner rather than later, One Odell Beckham Jr., yeah. and don't right. forget about Landon Collins too because he's going to be oh, a free yeah. agent after this year. So the Giants do need to have some – players that can contribute to the team's success at controllable costs, you find those guys in the draft. But one of the things that I think Giants fans have to think about, and it's in recent memory, is remember back to the time when Phil Simms retired and before you drafted Eli Manning. There's about a decade in there where the Giants weren't very good. And they had the likes of Danny Cannell and Kent Graham and Dave Brown and Kerry Collins. Man, starting Danny Cannell was good. The Giants start, were bad. Starting that quarterback. <laughs> so, I mean, that, 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 that's <laughs> exactly. You know what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, but exactly. There right. are people that are concerned. Yeah, let's not forget. Yeah, exactly. There are people mm. in that building that are concerned about who's going to be our face for the foreseeable future after Eli Manning. You don't have that in-house. So when you heard John Mara talking about he would like to see a succession plan like they had in Green Bay, the handoff from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers, or what you saw with the 49ers, the handoff from Montana to Steve Young, when he's talking like that, it makes me think that the Giants have a conviction on a quarterback and they want to go with a quarterback at number two. What the All the stuff we've heard is how highly rated what you just said, these four, five, four quarterbacks are, how good they are. They're all different, but they're all very good. Where they fit, we don't really know. We don't 100% know what the, what the exact look of the Giants' offense is going to be. So how locked in do you think they would just be at Sam Darnold? And if they had their choice of the other three because he was gone – would they maybe shift things a little bit so that they could at least guarantee themselves a quarterback? Let's say hypothetically Cleveland takes Josh Allen. What do you think the Giants would do then? Draft Sam Donald. I but think they draft Sam Donald. If, right. you think that if you heard they like Sam, yeah. Darnold's well, on I didn't the hear table. they like Sam. I'm just assuming yeah, yeah. that they okay, like Sam. I know they like one so quarterback. So let's assume they yeah. like Sam and that Sam goes number one. And he That's goes yeah. number one. Question. Yeah. Do you think they would like any of the other quarterbacks enough? Or what you're hearing is they like one guy enough to take it That's number two, saying. and if that guy's not there, they're going to do something else. That's what I heard. They like one guy, and if he's going to be there, then they're probably going to go that direction. If not, I can envision them trading down. I don't see them going the route of a Quentin Nelson or a Saquon Barkley. I just don't see it. I don't see the value in it. So, to me, it's important when you consider the separation and talent from the different positions. There's a lot of depth in this draft. Peter King on Monday Morning Quarterback talked about this. Through the first 12 picks, you're probably going to have cornerstone players, and then after that, from 12 through the third round, yeah. you got quality starters. Right. So, if you don't get your guy, if you don't have your quarterback sitting there at two, then trade back because your team has a lot of holes to fill, both on the offensive side of the ball and the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. You can come away with a lot of quality starters, which is what the Giants are going to need. Jenna, your concern is that the Giants don't have the luxury, it sounds weird to say, that Cleveland had a couple years ago, which is saying, we can pass on a quarterback this year. We know we're going to be right. drafting high again next year. Right. We can do it again. We know we're going to have a top five picking in it's next year. It's not like it's a different position. The, You're talking the, about the quarterback the position. Giant, and the Giants hope and believe the defense is going to be better. They got a better head coach. And that they're not going to be drafted in the top ten anytime soon. That's the mm -hmm. that's your concern if they Correct. don't take a quarterback. It, it makes sense. 
very concerned about it, Chris. I'm very concerned about it. It's going to be fine, Jenna. They got the right guy buying the groceries. Dave Gettleman knows what he's doing. Okay. All right, Dave. What he said. Chris, stick around. Coming up, have the Patriots found the missing piece to their offense? That's next on First Things First. Back here on First Things First with Chris Canty. On Wednesday, the Patriots said goodbye to Brandon Cooks. On Thursday, they said hello to Jordan Matthews. They didn't say it like that. New England signed Matthews to a one-year <laughs> deal. Hello, That was funny, Jenna. Uh, Belichick. That was his voice. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, Darden. To a one-year deal yesterday. He struggled in Buffalo last season, only catching 25 balls and dealing with injuries all year. So, Chris Kenny, how much will Matthews be able to replace the productivity of Brandon Cooks? Well, they brought him in to be an option, a part of a collective effort to try to replace the production that Cooks brought mm -hmm. to the table. I don't think one player is going to do it because, oh, yeah, yeah, Jordan Matthews hasn't been that guy, even though he's been a productive receiver. If you look at his first three years in Philadelphia, Philly. 225 catches, 2,600 yards, 19 touchdowns. Like, he's a guy that can play ball, but he's typically a slot receiver. That's where he's had most of his success mm -hmm. in the NFL. Now, he's a bigger slot receiver. He's 6'3", 210, so he's one of those bigger guys. But it'd be interesting to see how the Patriots deploy him along with Chris Hogan and Julian Edelman, depending on who's going to be the slot guy and who the two outside receivers are going to be. Now, it's not like we haven't seen the Patriots bring in big slot receivers and put those guys on the outside because Chris Hogan was a slot guy in Buffalo. Yep. They put him outside. They had Brandon LaFell before that. Oh, yeah. He was a slot guy in Carolina they put him outside so it just depends on what they want to do mm -hmm. in terms of utilizing the pieces that they have but regardless of how they do it we know it's going to look different because there is not going to be that one guy that's the dedicated speed threat outside of uh Brandon Cook the opposite Outs outside, outside of what they had and in out Brandon Cooks right, yeah exactly. yeah they don't have that speed guy so it's going to look different how they're going to manufacture yards unless yeah, I, they're not done well, no, no, they're definitely not done. They're right. not done. There's no yeah. way they go to the 2018 season with the wide receiving core that they have because they still have tremendous question marks. Their best wide receiver in um, Edelman, he'll be coming back from a knee surgery. One of their other dependable receivers who missed m most of this year, Malcolm Mitchell, he's been a contributor there. And him – and Jordan are kind of like the same receivers, almost the same type of build. Jordan might be a little bit different. What becomes very important here is Josh McDaniels. What is Josh going to do with this talent? Is he going to play Jordan in the slot? Because they play him in the slot opposite of Gronk. Because one option with Gronk is to get another tight end or get another big receiver. So now they love to run those seam routes. Brady's far more accurate in throwing to a bigger body down the seams than those smaller guys. Be but I don't see Jordan replacing the yards after the catch. All right? I see him being a very dependable veteran wide receiver. Gets along with in, in the Patriot locker room. Tom Brady likes him. He's dependable. But, I mean, they need some bona fide playmakers. And I know they've done it with less. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I mean, Tom's got how many seasons left? The more talent you have, Nick, the better off you're tops. going to be. Yeah. You literally <laughs> the, cannot have more than 15 in it. Yeah, time <laughs> is quick. Right? Right. I, yeah. I do one. want the audience, though, to understand this. It is not a lock Jordan Matthews is on the team week one. Oh, no. absolutely. Like, that is, that is, given the contract he signed, the amount of money, and the lack of guaranteed money, this is the – Bill Barnwell, I thought, put it really well on Twitter – it, this we will either look back on this as one of the guys the Patriots bring in and cut, or a guy. It's like, wow, what a value they got! Like, what a bargain! Another ex instance of the Patriots finding treasure where not signing the bad contract. Exactly right. So, but I do have this level of concern as far as why he was available. Buffalo is obviously trying to draft a franchise quarterback, right? They don't have a plethora of wide receiving options, right? No. So, like, they. No, Andre Reid is retired long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And it has been for a while. And so, Philly, you keep in mind, they moved off him last year when they were trying to get better at the wide receiver core. When they brought in Dory Smith, like, they, they, mm -hmm. they, the big. Alshon, 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 Alshon Jeffrey, Alshon thank Jeff. you. They, they brought in. Nelson Aguilar into his position, and they got better at it. Exactly. And so, like, I, the, I'm not trying to crush the kid. Like, it's a good opportunity for him. But I don't want people to think, oh, okay, so they took out Brandon Cooks. They're sliding in Jordan Matthews. They're going to get the same production at way less money. Like, that is not a realistic. But I can't no. admit, I'm not willing to say that I'm some type of expert. I'm never wrong. Man, when they signed Chris Hogan, I was sitting there like, what they going to do with him?
Right. I mean, that's what they do. I know that's the flavor ice cream yeah. they like. <laughs> but my goodness, like what they gonna do with him? Or you and just so, gonna tell it on Friday? I mean, yeah. and surprise. I mean, Friday is a fire day. That's uh, what okay. they, I, 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 I see. You. I see. But I mean. Look at the productivity that they've gotten out of them. So I wouldn't yeah. be shocked in New England, but you bring up a good point. This is a tryout. Yeah. It's I mean, a tryout. Yeah, like he, 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 if he doesn't play well, like he gets hurt in training camp, oh, they will cut him before the first game. But it's not like there are a plethora of options out there at this point. We don't have a ton that we're going to see through the draft, and there aren't a number of guys out there that, that you know that the Patriots are definitely eyeing or going after. This could be a guy, I mean, who knows, that they'll have to make a Chris Hogan out of. Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's still a lot of offseason left. We don't know what's going to fall to them in the draft. We also don't know what veteran receivers are going to get cut because teams are going to be important. in a position mm. to start cutting guys as training camp progresses. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But one thing we know about Bill Belichick, he's always going to find those diamonds in the rough, those value picks to add to his roster. It's going to look different than it did with Brandon Cooks. I, I just don't see them being able to add that element to their yeah. offense you at this point. He led the league in receptions yeah, receptions of 20-plus yards. yards downfield. I mean, they're not going to be able to add somebody of that explosion for the amount of money that they're looking to spend. So now, it's, it's going to look different. Now, also, we don't know what they're going to do with Philip Dorsett, who they got in a trade last year from Indianapolis, who has the Brandon Cooks type speed, has the same body type. Also, let's not forget, they traded for Cordero Patterson from the Oakland Raiders. He's more of a special teams player, a guy who runs reverses, hasn't really reached his potential as a wide receiver, former um, number one draft pick for the Minnesota Vikings. Do they utilize him on some of those deep throws, him and Philip Dorsett, to be able to ease the pressure, or, or ease the pressure in their passing game and to be able to break up this role of what Cooks did and, and what Amendola did for their passing game. Just real quick before we move off this, you know Jordan the person a little bit. You, you didn't. He grew up, I think, in Alabama, but you worked with him some offseason, did some coaching or some clinics, something with him. Tell a lot of times when the Patriots sign a player, it's partially on the field, but it's partially who they are, how smart they are. They pick up the offense. Are they going to cause like? Are they a Patriot type of player? Right. Tell everyone who this guy is. Great guy, family guy. A pro's pro, going to work hard. Tom Brady and them tell him, if they tell him 15 yards, he will be at 15 and a quarter and dare, dare you to measure. He can play outside. He can play inside. So he is the, the type of player that the Patriots, they do well with. A guy who's been other places, maybe didn't reach his potential, and also a college graduate. Smart guys. From people, Vanderbilt. Yeah, yeah. people were, <laughs> but They get a lot of brothers in yeah. Vanderbilt. They sneak them in. No, but, uh, <laughs> this is a guy I'm just yeah. saying, graduate yeah. from there. That's yeah. a good yeah, school. But, uh, yeah. Also, Jay Cutler went there, too. So, uh, 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 but <laughs> well, he, he got fit he, into he what they a, do. He had a motivator cuff issue. A motivator cuff. I never <laughs> heard that one. That's a good, that's a good line to end it on. I'm Jenna Wolf, and thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Make sure to subscribe and tell your friends, family, and coworkers about the podcast, which, by the way, is available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. You can catch a fresh new episode every Monday through Friday on FS1, starting at 6.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. Pacific. So long, everyone.